Sam opens the back door of the newspaper building. He folds the newspaper under one arm, takes a pole from a flask and walks across the porch of Julia's home. He starts to knock on the door, thinks better of it, and then pushes the trunk that was under the window away from the house and lays down behind it. His feet stick out at either end. He is in no way hidden. Ying Tai, a young Chinese girl, enters stage right carrying a rope, an abacus, and a small slate with a white piece of chalk tied on. Uh, Zhao Sheng Hao, good miserable sunshine mountain morning to you. Oh, Sam, the drunk white devil who teaches me the best words. Oh, stumbling dictionary. Can I have my paper? The sound of printing press suddenly stops. Sam holds the paper up above the trunk. Ying Tai grabs it and sits on the trunk and begins to read. She begins reading, imitating Sam's voice. There's a feeling of everyday familiarity, familiarity about these events. It is right and wholesome to have those light comedies and entertaining shows, and I shouldn't wish to see them diminished. Diminished? Made small. But none of us is always in the comedy spirit. We have our graver moods. They come to us all. The lightest of us cannot escape them. These moods have their appetites, healthy and legitimate appetites, and ought to be some way of satisfying them. It seems to me that New York ought to have one theater devoted to tragedy. With her three millions of population and 70 outside millions to draw upon, she can afford it. She can support it. America devotes more time, labor, money, and attention to distributing literary and musical culture among the general public than does any other nation. Perhaps, yet here you find her neglecting what is possibly the most effective of all the breeders and nurses and disseminators of high literary taste and lofty emotion, the tragic stage. To leave that powerful agency out is to haul the culture wagon with a crippled team. Nowadays, when a mood comes, which only Shakespeare can set to music, what must we do? Read Shakespeare ourselves? Isn't it pitiful? It is playing an organ solo on a Jew's harp. We can't read. None but the booths can do it. Then, with a tragedy tonic once or twice a month, we shall enjoy the comedy comedies all the better. Comedy keeps the heart sweet. But we all know that there is a wholesome refreshment for both mind and heart in an occasional climb among the solemn pomps of the intellectual snow stomachs built by Shakespeare and those others. Do I seem to be preaching? It is out of my line. I only do it because the rest of the clergy seem to be on vacation. Chen Bo, a young Chinese man, enters from stage left carrying a brazier, brazier and a wood, a wood bundle on a yoke. He seems completely undisturbed by the sound. He sets the yoke down, gets the wood bundle, and walks in the front door. She sits on the porch next to the brazier, warming herself in a fashion and fashions a necklace with the abacus and slate in front. She writes in the slate in big letters, fire starter every morning, number misses, five cents. When she is almost finished, Shambo comes out. Uh, Zhao Sheng Hao, good, more, good miserable sunshine morning to you, oh deaf mathematician boy. And Shambo says, why do you do that? Talk to me with words. I like the picture talk better. She signs and speaks. That way I can say anything I want first thing in the morning when I am irritable and have had no coffee. Besides, you have to keep talking and watching mouths so you don't forget how. You are the only deaf man I know who knows two languages and can talk. I'm the only deaf person either one of us know. And you were here determined and you were determined to make me talk just so I can teach you. Everything I ever learned from scholars in China is now in your head. What good is knowledge if it is not shared? Look what I made. This sign says. You start fires for whores every morning, five cents each, no misses. All the Chinese history and literature and math I know. It helps so much I, when I'm searching for wood for fires. We have the customers we need already. Only because I knocked on all the doors and told them, Shambo. What, what about when they change, when a new one comes? My scribe business is taking off. I can't be your manager every day. I am plotting my escape. Why do you say that? Xing Tai, you're fine right here, or you're fine here. Maybe until I blossom. What happens when I can't be your little brother anymore? What happens when Ah Sin finds I am a girl? I will be locked in a crib serving the white devil so fast. What luck we have had to live outside Chinatown and keep to ourselves. I want to go back to San Francisco. I want to be a scholar. I want to write letters for stupid Chinamen like you back to families who only care about the money you send. 
I won't let them put you in the crib in a crib. I do enough for uh, I do enough for both of the big houses that neither will bother us. We live between them. And just how would you stop them? You are a mathematician brought low by gambling and fever. You start fires for white women who never look at you. You don't even belong to a tong. When you die, no one will send your bones home. You will be here, the big forever. Sometimes you're just a mean, unpleasant person. I am 15 and the rarest of wonders, a Chinese girl without an owner. That I have this gift of tongues is a mystery to me. I read the territorial enterprise every morning. Sam tells me any words I don't know. They are fewer and fewer. The morning I don't need any more words, I think he will be insulted. Why are you so bitter? You have this gift. You learn languages hearing them once. You can hear. Sometimes it is a curse, not a gift. I can hear what they say about me when I walk by. At least this hand talk was fun to create. You taught me English when you were four years old. You know Chinese, Spanish, French, English, and Piatu? Paiu. Paiu, okay. I am thinking I want to find a Russian. I need another language in my collection. And really, I am ignorant. I can only write English and Chinese. You are kind of a freak. You maybe that's why you're so you're all you're so sideways. I am sideways to save my life. If I did not disguise myself as a scholar boy, I would be in danger. We are like the butterfly lovers. That is why I made us take their names. At least you already knew English before the fever took your ears. You owe me. You have to teach me some more math. How am I supposed to run my own business if I am ignorant, please? Math is another language. Think of it like that. What? Yes, this works. The numbers are the things and the multipliers are the ways we move them around. Nouns and verbs? Brilliant. Brilliant. I know, he is. Let me show you. I'll use the slate, you use the abacus. School time, then I have more fires to light. Quick, get this. Remember when we were here? And how do you add in the thousand? Like this? No, no. Carry it. Oh. Ying Tai in four houses. I will. Sh I will have you finish for the day. Uh, thank you, Shambo. He picks up the yoke. She puts a slate around his neck. They exit stage left. Sam watches them leave. Curiously lifts the trunk lid and picks up two battered books and some newspapers. Closes the lid and sits on the trunk and addresses the audience. These two piqued my interest just days after my arrival. Accompanied by a fellow reporter, we made our trip our, through our Chinese quarter and ate chow chow with chopsticks and the celestial restaurants. Our crime and tried to whip the moon-eyed damsels in front of the houses for their want of feminine reserve. We received protecting Josh lights from our host and dickered for a pagan god or two. Finally, we were impressed with the genius of a Chinese bookkeeper, this young Shanbo. He lost his hearing in a fever, but he makes his way. His little brother is quite remarkable. Language and math in one family. He figured up his accounts on a machine like a gridian, and with buttons strung on its bars, the different rows represented units, tens, hundreds, and thousands. He figured them with incredible rapidity. In fact, he pushed them from place to place as fast as a musical professor's fingers traveled over the keys of a piano. Our hostess must be sleeping yet. This little morning ritual, newspaper and coffee on our Juliet's balcony. What a strange dawn family we are. Misfits, miscreants, and a newspaper man belonging nowhere but our Virginia City. Julia abides within, still sleeping with the night's prince, I suppose. I will guard her door. Sam steps back behind the trunk with practice ease, lays down behind it, and sleeps. Scene two. The front panel of the house, including the porch, is hinged. It opens towards center stage, revealing the interior of the cabin. Sam is now off stage. Jean and Julia are dressing for the day. Jean is in a fancy and is fancy and dirty at the same time. The real language in the world is a kiss. No, the only real language in the world is money. I didn't know Chinamen could learn English. It is hard for me. Your French is not bad for an Englishwoman. Out here in the territories, we all choose who we get to be. In New Orleans, being English was exotic. Here, being French makes me special. So my French sounds a little Creole. Only real Frenchies know that little secret. John Millian, uh, John Millian your countrywoman, Miss Kazan, K 
Pazentra, who runs the restaurant in Gold Hill, she said your name was really John Marie a villain. We all have our secrets. Ying Tai is special. Who knew a scholar could bloom in this territory? That one's worth some money. Get her in a crib. Speaking of, that one is a child. Look, her people think she is a boy. The fire starter stole her from a whorehouse in San Francisco when she was young. He was doing their books, got the fever, and she was just, she was set to nurse him. Then everyone in the house got sick. Her mother died and he woke up after the fever, deaf, alone, and scared. That one made up some home talk, they call it, with their hands. They both knew what was what. When she was four or five, I think, and he just put her on his back, covered himself with the fever blanket, and walked out the door. He knew the life she was going to be sold into. He put her in boys' clothes and left for Virginia City with a new little brother. You know everyone's secrets. This bed is unconventional or unconfessional. More like my porch on early mornings. It is a schoolhouse. Sam used to read to him. Now she reads to him. Listen, they are just two kids. Leave it alone. A One kiss. more kiss. A kiss. Hard bargain. She leans in as if to kiss him, then zags to the liquor cabinet. She pours him a whiskey and gives him gives it to him with a bow, takes the coverlet off the bed and exits onto the porch. Her exit should be timed and its hinged movement hinged unit moves about 45%. She exits from the house and he follows as if the wall swings back to its original position. Sam stands up when Julia enters and the two men have a moment of sizing up each other sizing each other up. Jean steps off the porch. Julia sits on the trunk. Sam sits on the porch, leaning against the trunk and Julia. Jean exits off to the right. Unrequited something. Sam silently hands Julia a flask. She takes a nip, gives it back to him, and he nestles closer to her leg as she sits on the trunk. She ruffles his hair. Clearly, they are close friends. Clearly, she feels more deeply for him. I don't like that one. You don't like anyone exiting my door. True enough. But who am I to get in the way of commerce? Just for a moment, let's be two friends rising early and join the quiet after the press run is finished and before the day starts. I'll be your friend until the day starts. When we saw each other on, on Union the other day, you forgot who I was for a moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, as with the ladies, I'm writing a story about the sanitary ball next week. I didn't want them to scorn you. I see, so you did it for them. Julia. Sam, or should I call you Mark now? Sam, I am not ashamed of who I am, of what I do. Five years ago, I walked anywhere in this little town anytime I wanted, and every door was open to me. Now we keep off Main Street during the day. Might be time to move along soon, too many wives. Julia, I was going to ask you, would you attend the sanitary ball with me? You surprise me again, Sam. You know I can't do that. They would faint if I arrived at their fundraiser. You, wearing that purple dress and your furs. They might fade of jealousy. I am sure the intent of the sanitary ball is to get rid of everyone who doesn't look like them. The whores, the Chinese, even the Irish. They are raising money to make their, this city better, safer, more civilized. We made this town, but they are remaking it in their image. I like you better being exactly who you are in your volunteer fireman's shirt, running out to help out a fire, letting those two have school on your porch every morning, letting the little ones store her papers and books in your trunk, watching out for them. Kindness is the language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. I see you, Julia. I see you, Sam. Thanks for the invite. Anyway, I have a previous commitment. Tom Peasley is coming up from Carson. He has rented the star for the night. We will have a saloon de refuse. We will have dancing and drinking and opium in the little rooms with closed curtains. And I will be writing on a deadline about the good ladies of our fair city. Someone must. <laughs> yes, someone must. Sam exits stake. Sam exits the back of the Territorial Enterprise stage right and stops on the landing and jumps up and down on it a couple of times. He walks down the steps and pushes his boot in the front flap of the canvas tent, which is under the stair landing, waits patiently. Thank you for knocking. Pardon for disturbing your home. It is an honor it's to have you. 
I find myself in need of a celestial scribe. That is what he said. We were under the impression that you were literate. Don't be rude. Sam, my little brother has no manners and that is my fault. A great many people share your reservations about my literary prospects. <laughs> Let me tell you a story. My dear mother and I have an ongoing correspondence. He says he writes to his mother. I didn't think he was tied so tightly to those apron strings. It stretches the bonds of, I forgot the word, what is the word? Hmm, incredulity? Yes, that's it. It stretches those bonds. Why do you want a, why do you want a letter written in Chinese to your mother? She vexes me with letters written on bits and scraps of paper as if I'm not worth a clean, dry, unwrinkled page. I'm sure she writes these missives in spare moments throughout the day, and to speak plainly, I treasure any word from her. But I think she deserves a letter from me, which would be that much more difficult to decipher. And as your excellent scribe services is just taking off, I thought I would avail myself. Happy to help. He is taunting his mother with an unreadable letter. He says he'll tell us what to write. We are at your service. Mother, I hope this letter finds you well. Mother, I hope this letter finds you well. Virginia City is hot, dusty, and devoid of any of the niceties of society. Sunshine Mountain is a devil's cesspool. Really? Well, that's what he said. Besides, no one will ever read this letter, so we can say whatever we want. I wish some of these, those niceties might be loosened between us, so I could tell you about a most fascinating woman of my acquaintance. No, don't write that. He, he says, says he's in love with a whore who has a fascination with firemen. I sometimes despair at being away from you and our dear sister. I miss you, Mammy and Sis. Maybe this is why I drink so much. I am learning from my friendship with two of the most industrious, kind, and above all, honest brothers who remind me of Orion and myself as youngsters. He is one of the best white men I have met. He looks directly at me in any case. I can mostly read his lips. It would be better without the caterpillar on his mouth. Mother, remember how we teased and taunted our sister and created every kind of mischief possible? Yes, these two are much like us. I hope you enjoyed this missive. I will write again soon. Sam, your mother is a lucky woman to have such a son. He says, clever mother, clever son. Here's another letter written for her. I'll nest this in an envelope for a moment of levity. This is for your trouble. Yintai, can you get it to the post before it leaves? I will run so fast up every hill. You take good care of her. I mean, of your brother. This is my biggest, this is my big fear that others will find out. But we do all right. I take care of her. Would it be better for you back in San Francisco? Thank you. No, Sam. Look, Julia told me the story. What Yintai shared, anyway. I am responsible. I took her. I took her. We do fine here. There is no danger. Couldn't you do better in a bigger city? I'm going back to the city next month. You two could come with me. Means uh, the red tr the red trend will not break. We're all time. Any place connect any place connected. If we go anywhere, it will be to my cousin in Aberdeen. It is not really my business, but girls get stolen all the time. You have seen the cribs. You don't want that for her. I understand. I must convince her to marry. But you are right. It is not your business. If you need anything, will you come to me? Thank you, scholar. We are better for having you in our life. They stand looking off stage right, both waiting for Ying Tai's return. Scene five, lights up. Night, a bright full moon, spotlight, Sam dressed in a suit, standing on the back landing of the territorial enterprise. Spotlight on Julia on the porch of the cabin. She's in a red and blue volunteer fireman's dress and has her honorary helmet on, the railing beside her. The sanitary ball at La Plata Hall on Thursday night was, very, was a very marked success and provided beyond the shadow of a doubt, the correctness of our theory. The ladies never fail in undertakings of this kind. I have special customers and special friends, the Virginia Engine Company number one. They are both for me. They have 
their party the same night as the sanitary ball and every high class hurdy girl in Virginia City was treated like a queen. The worthy ladies of the, in, of the city got wind of it and were not amused. We had just finished executing one of the most inscrutable figures of the plain quadrille. We were feeling unusually comfortable and we had assumed an attitude. We have a sort of talent for posturing, a pensive attitude, copied from the Colossus of Rhodes when the ladies were ordered to the center. Two of them got there and the other two moved off gallantly, but they failed to make the connection. They suddenly broached to under the full headway and there was a sound of parting canvas. Their dresses were anchored under our boots, you know. It was unfortunate, but cannot be helped. Those two beautiful pink dresses let go amidship and remained in a ripped and damaged condition to the end of the ball. We did not apologize because our presence of mind happened to be absent the very moment that we had the greatest need of it, but we begged permission to do so now. There is a struggling on for the wild soul of this town. Now that there are more wives here, the married men don't meet my eyes on Main Street, and even if they visit me an hour later. The young unmarried daughters are perhaps the most vicious. They want the whores to leave town, and if they can't manage that, then they want to legislate us into invisibility. I did not ask Sam to write what he did about the ball, but that piece was funny and cutting and a bit dangerous. I hope none of the ladies' fathers or husbands take offense. An excellent supper was served in a large dining room of the new What Cheer House on B Street. We missed it there somewhat. We were not accompanied by a lady, and consequently, we were not eligible to, uh, eligible to a seat at the first table. We found out all that at the Gold Hill Ball, and we had intended to be all prepared for this one. We engaged a good many young ladies last Tuesday to go with us, thinking that of the lot, we should certainly be able to secure one at the appointed time but they all seem to have got a little angry about something. Nobody knows what, for the ways of women are past finding out. They told us we had better go off and invite a thousand girls to go to the ball, a thousand. Why, it was absurd. We have no use for a thousand girls. A, a thousand, those girls were cr as crazy as loons. In every instance, after they had uttered the pointless suggestion, they marched magnificently out of their parlors. And if you will believe us, not one of them ever recollected to come back again. Why, it was the most unaccountable experience we ever heard of. We never enjoyed so much solitude in so many different places in one evening before. But patience has its limits. We finally got tired of that arrangement. And at the risk of offending some of those girls, we stalked off to the sanitary ball alone without a virgin out of that whole litter. Lights transition to Ying Tai stage left in a spot. Scene six, Papillon. Lights up, another dark early morning on Julie's porch. Sound, the printing press rumbles across the stage. Ying Tai is set, seated on the steps, hands in her ears, heads down, waiting for Shambo. There is a final hinge reverberation and then suddenly silence. Ying Tai looks up smiling and sighs happily in the quiet. Jean exits Julia's door, pulling on his coat and carrying a white baker's apron. Bon matin, monsieur. My little butterfly. Uh, je suis petit, mais pas votre quelque chose. I am small, but not your anything. You speak well. You can go on the stage with your skill. No stages. Why not, little brother? You are a wonder with your languages. You should go to school. Become a learned man. You speak of dreams. You work in a bakery. I help my brother warm the houses of whores and make some pennies writing letters for men who will never see their families again. This is all you want. <laughs> no, I see a dream in your delicate eyes. You are disturbing. There are some sing-song boys up on D Street you can go talk to. <laughs> you think I'm a perastradan? I have just left the arms of the loveliest woman in this town. I just know more about you. Papillion than you imagine. Another six months, everyone will know, and you will become and you will be someone's property. Why not me? You could belong to La Blanc de La Blanc instead of the Chiniso. You can belong to a La Blanc instead of Chinois. Uh, Chin who will never who never lets you out of the crib. I belong to no one. I am my own man. Yes, Le Garçon. Yeah, Le Garçon Sue. Le Garçon Sue belongs to you more than you belong to him. 
That deaf boy is my brother, and he is strong. And he is not here. Not now. Maybe he is coming soon, but there will be other times you'll be sitting alone. This is a disaster. Hey, you are louder than the printing press out here. Jean, you have paid for your time at my house, and you can leave now satisfied. And Jean, I don't say this often, but I mean it. Don't come back. Oh, ladies, I do not stay where I am not wanted. Until I choose to return. Julia Lafroyos de este orden de Vonteros Papillion. Julia, the bloom is off your rose. Butterfly. He's just called you old, Julia. The cabin begins to open and Julia opens her arms. Ying Tai goes into them and they both enter the door as it swings to its open position. They are now inside the cabin. I am found out. What do I do? What a vile man. It was coming. We all knew it. You were just becoming so beautiful, so special. My body betrays me. I think we should talk to Sam. Look, your only safety is in marriage. I am just 15. If I marry, no more business, no more languages. I do not want a cook stove and babies. I cannot wear robes and braid my hair. Did you think you could live forever? Did you think you could forever live as a man? The only Chinese women I have seen are locked in tiny cages, pressing their breasts through the bars, yelling at me to leave my boyish chastity behind. That is how they phrased it. No, they say, pretty boy, come back here and lick me. Being a woman is not all bad. Look. Julia takes Ying Tai's hat off, wraps Ying Tai in a red silk robe, and turns her around so she can see herself in the mirror. Oh. Shambo enters the door with a sack of kindling to light the fire. He sees Ying Tai and drops dead. Shambo, I'm sorry. The Frenchman knows. I don't know what. What do we do? Marry me. Ah! Lights out. <laughs> Scene seven, the butterfly lovers lights up. Ying Tai and Shambo sit outside in their tent stage right, eating a meal, silence, and obvious tension. They both speak and sign the following. The entire scene dialogue is also projected onto the site. Um, are you going to keep ignoring me? It is insufferable. Stop pouting. I failed you. I will kill the Frenchman and we can become normal again. You saved me. And nothing has ever been normal. I live sideways. I took you from that sick I took you from that sick house. You are my responsibility. I was four and you were 16. I did not teach you how to be a proper Chinese woman. What did you know about raising a sister? I was pretending to be your brother. I remember home, you know. I did not leave our home shore until I was 13. I was born in a whorehouse. My maternal mother followed the three of obedience. Before marriage, a woman should obey her father. After marriage, she is to obey her husband. Finally, after the death of her husband, she should obey her son, if she has any. My mother never got a chance to teach me to be a virtuous woman. Your mother was my age when she died. Her virtue was stolen from her when she was sold to come here. She had no choice of behavior. You do. I told you from the, I told you about the four womanly virtues, chastity, fidelity, and womanly words, womanly bearing, and womanly work. I have been pretending to be a boy for 10 years. I have my own thoughts. Too late for me to be a virtuous woman. Simply put, a good woman is supposed to behave modestly, speak softly, dress up prettily, and sue and weave diligently in order to please and honor her husband and family. Shambo, both of us are throwaway people. There is no family honor for me to protect. My line is broken. This idea of, uh, this idea you have of protecting a pearl, your treasure, it, it is not real. No, we are a win together. I am the strong physical man protecting you and you were win. I let you be a uh, chat. You? KZ. Kate, was it? It's KZ. KZ. I let you be KZ, the talented boy scholar. We don't live in a time or place where your childhood stories matter. We live in a mining camp 
where women my color with, eye, with my eyes are bought and sold. I have never worn a woman's tunic, never sat prettily at someone's feet. We are, if nothing, peasants. Let us just be honestly that. It would have been better for me not to teach you, not to find you every book you asked for. You know the stories, but you have not lived the life. Maybe you are right. You told me the story of the butterfly lovers, of two friends living and learning together. They are Sam's, Shakespeare's, Romeo and Juliet, and we are not them. I know that. Mostly because they died. Shambo and Ying Tai died just like Romeo and Juliet. Who dies of a broken heart? It is ridiculous. I loved this story when I was five and you told it to me over and over before we slept. I try to give you some beauty, some romance, something good from our home. People keep moving. They make breakfast with maybe tears in the food. I have no time to be this sad. We have to figure out how to survive this right now. This man knows I am a woman. I don't want to be a tragedy, but I don't want to marry you just because I need to be someone's property. Could you marry me because I love you? You are my brother. If we were to keep the, or if, we were, if, I, if we are giving up the story, then we have to give it all up. I am not your kin. I'm going to Ashin's to find out where the Frenchman lives. We need to see if he makes any plans. Austin will make you sign to his house. I am coming with you. No, stay home. I can manage without you. Someone's sister, someone's wife, someone's mother. That's it. That is all I can hope for? No, you could always be a whore. <sighs> One or the other? I'm sorry. I just want to keep you safe. You just want to keep me. I'm going to figure out, I'm going to find out more about the Frenchman. Stay here. As you desire. Lights crossfade upstage left cabin. Sam and Julia enter stage left. He is holding her up. She is drunk. Ying Tai sees them struggling to get her up the porch and runs to help. Sam, you need help? Sometimes Miss Julia forgets what is good for business. Not often, but when she starts on this path, she finishes. I have to go to San Francisco because of this idiotic dualness. Who will watch after her when I'm gone? Butterfly, did she tell you, Sam, we have, your debut we have a debutante? I think Mr. Sam knew long ago, but he was circumspect. Listen, Jean heard you talking on the porch one morning. I didn't tell your secret. It's all right, Julia, the time was coming. Will you put this lady to bed? I have a dove to me, a big story to get to Prince. Sam, you go to work. I will make sure she is tucked in and the light off. No visitors for her tonight. Sam stands back on, stands on the back platform of the territorial enterprise and reads his writing, making notes as he speaks. They promoted me to be editor in chief and I lasted just a week by the watch, but I made an uncommonly lively newspaper while I did last. And when I retired, I had a duel on my hands and three horse whippings promised me. The latter, I made no attempt to collect. However, this history concerns only the former. In the course of my editing, I made trouble with Mr. Lord, editor of the rival new paper. He flew off about some little trifle or other that I said about him. I don't remember now, what was it? I suppose I call him a thief or a body snatcher <laughs> or an idiot or something like that. I was obliged to make the paper readable and I could not fail my duty to a whole community of subscribers merely to save the exaggerated sensitivities of an individual. Mr. Lord was offended and replied vigorously in his paper. Vigorously means a great deal when it refers to a personal editorial in a frontier newspaper. Dueling was all the fashion among the upper classes in the ca that country, and very few gentlemen would throw away an opportunity of fighting one. To kill a person in a duel caused a man to be even more looked up than to kill two men in the ordinary way. So I challenged Mr. Lord, and I did hope he would not accept, but I knew perfectly well that he did not want to fight, and so I challenged him in the most violent and implacable manner. And then I sat down and suffered and suffered till the answer came. All our boys, the editors were in our office, helping me in the dismal business and telling me about duels and discussing the code with a lot of aged ruffians who had experience in such things. And altogether, there was a loving interest taken in that matter, which made me unspeakably uncomfortable. The answer came, Mr. Lord declined. 
our boys were furious. And so was I, on the surface. I sent him another challenge and another and another. And the more he did not want to fight, the bloodthirstier I became. But at last that man's tone changed. He appeared to be waking up. It was becoming apparent that he was going to fight me after all. I ought to have known how it would be. He was a man who, would, who never could be depended on. Our boys were exultant. I was not, though I tried to be. It was time now to go out and practice. It was a custom there to fight duels with Navy six shooters at 15 paces, load and empty till the game for the funeral was secured. We went to a little ravine just outside town and borrowed a barn door for a target. Borrowed it off a gentleman who was absent. We stood this barn door up and stood a rail on end against the middle of it to represent Lord and put a squash on top of the rail to represent his head. He was a very tall, lean creature, the poor sort of material for a duel. Nothing but a line shot could fetch him, and even then he might split your bullet. Exaggeration aside, the rail was, of course, a little too thin to represent his body accurately. But the squash was all right. If there's any intellectual difference between the squash and his head, it was in favor of the squash. Well, I practiced and practiced at the barn door and could not hit it. And I practiced at the rail and could not hit that. And I tried hard for the squash, but could not hit the squash. I would have been entirely disheartened, but, the, but the, uh, that occasionally I crippled one of the boys. That encouraged me to hope. At last, we began to hear pistol shots nearby in the next ravine. We knew what that meant. The other party was out practicing too. Then I was in the last degree distressed. For of course, those people would hear our shots and they would send spies over to the ridge and the spies would find my barn door without a wound or a scratch and that would simply be the end of me. For of course, the other man would immediately become as bloodthirsty as I was. Just as this moment, a little, just at this moment, a little bird no long, larger than a sparrow flew by, lit on a sage rest about 30 paces away. And my little second, Steve Gillis, who was, matchless, who was a matchless marksman with a pistol, much better than I was snatched out his revolver and shot the bird's head off. We all ran to pick up the game and sure enough, just at that moment, some of the other duelists came reconnoitering over that little edge bridge. They ran to our group to see what the matter was. And when they saw the bird, Lord Second said, that was a splendid shot. How far off was it? Steve said with some indifference, oh, no great distance, about 30 paces. 30 paces, heaven alive, who did that? My man. Twain, the mischief he did, can he do that often? Well, yes, he can do it about, well, about four times out of five. I knew the little rascal was lying, but I never said anything. I never told him so. He was not of the disposition to invite confidences of that kind. So I let the matter rest, but it was of a comfort to see those people look sick, to see their underjaw drops when Steve made those statements. They went off and got Lord and took him home. And when we got home, half an hour later, there was a note saying that Mr. Lord preemptorily declined to fight. It was a narrow skate. We found out afterwards that Lord hit his mark 13 times in 18 shots. If he had put those 13 bullets through me, it would have narrowed my sphere of usefulness a good deal. Would have nigh well closed it, in fact. True, they could have put the pegs in the holes and used me for a hat rack. But what is a hat rack to a man who feels he has an intellectual powers? I would scorn such a position. Dueling is illegal. Even requesting a duel can be an excuse to be invited for an overnight, at least in territorial accommodation. It is time for me to get back to San Francisco. Sam exits stage right, stage right up the steps and into the back of the territorial enterprise. Did Shambo convince you to marry? He asked. I answered, no wedding. Julia, I have loved him since he slung me on his back and walked me out of the hell I was born into, but I have lived free, as free as a Chinese Kazai boy student can be. Ying Tai, can I tell you something? No one is free. You love him, marry him, make a life together. Start over somewhere else you did it before, be a wife and be a scholar. I just, don't want to have to marry him. Not everyone gets such a pleasant choice. Go home, I am going to sleep. Sound, the printing press starts up. It is loud and constant. 
I'm going to stuff my ears and go to sleep. Sweet dream. You too. She exits into her cabin. Ying Tai crosses the stage right towards her tent. Jean enters stage left following Ying Tai. He rushes behind her, tosses her over his shoulder, and crosses off stage left the way he came. Ying Tai screams, but she can't be heard over the printing press. Intermission. Intermission.